Croiso friends. Welcome back to Opus L and I where... Oh, you didn't think I was done with pirates, did you? In honor of both Pride Month and Taika Waititi's announcement of Our Flag Means Death Season 2, I decided to give in to my inclination to add more pirate core to my history-bounding wardrobe with another two garments. I felt like I definitely needed an 18th century menswear shirt. It is such a classic staple. Laura Lynn made a fantastic video on dissecting masculine shirts and how to size them to your body, and I will put a link to that video in the cards and in the description box. And they have an accompanying pattern schematic on their coffee shop for free or pay what you want, and I will make sure to link that as well. In addition to that, I bought Lena Piprick's Lillian Waspy waist cincher pattern back when it came out in her coffee shop and thought that increasing my pirate core history bounding closet would be as good of an excuse as any to make it now. I'm using the gunmetal gray silk fabric left over from my partner's dragon tunic facing because much like Blackbeard, I wear fine things well. Today's video is going to be a little longer, so everyone get comfy and go grab a snack and your cuppa. Today I am drinking my old standby Harney & Sons vanilla tea with a splash of cream and some honey because I am all about familiar comfort tea today. Let's get into it. For the shirt, I'm using some linen fabric that came pre-pintucked. I've had this sitting in my stash for years, waiting for the right project. Is it historically accurate? It's as historically accurate as the plot of Our Flag Means Death, and that's really the bar we're aiming for, I think. The nice thing about the pin tucks is they make straight cuts pretty easy, and the grooves in my collapsible sewing table take care of the rest. Because of where the cut falls on the sleeve pieces, I'm going to seam rip and iron out the pin tuck that falls right at the cutting line so I don't have to worry about that extra fabric getting in the way. After the body and sleeves are cut, it's time to carve out the cuffs and collar pieces, and last but not least, the underarm and shoulder gussets. The final piece of prep before I start sewing is to mark out the neck slits. Since the body front and back are all in one piece, I need to cut a T-shaped slit for the neck and collar. You can see the general cutting layout that I used for my piece of fabric, and there was so little left over, in my trusty graph paper notebook there. It's been a minute since I did a hand-sewn project and I needed things to be portable that week, so here we go. As usual, I'm using 83 linen thread from Burnley and Trowbridge, pre-cut into working lengths and waxed and ironed. You may notice that although the shirt is basically a rectangular construction, I'm assembling it in a different order from what you've seen in my medieval tunic and dress videos. I'm starting off by assembling the sleeves before attaching them to the body. The first step of that process will be to insert the underarm gussets into the top of the sleeve using a back stitch for strength.
Then I will sew the length of the sleeve, leaving an opening at the cuff to make sure my hand will fit through. This time I'm using a running back stitch, which is basically three or four running stitches taken at once with a single back stitch between. It's a compromise between ease and strength. Since the sleeve seams aren't taking much stress, I can afford to use a stitch that sacrifices a bit of strength for speed. Then I will fell down all of those seams at once and finish the cuff slits with rolled hems. Then I can set the sleeves aside to work on the body. The first thing to do on the body is cut the horizontal neckline slit and sew in the neckline gussets. I didn't get great footage of this process since I was at my partner's house, but basically I'm taking a small plain square of linen, folding the edges under, and then folding that into a triangle which I will use to protect the ends of the neck slit and create an angle to accommodate the trapezius muscles in my shoulders. If that doesn't make sense, I highly suggest taking a look at Aura's video, they do a way better job of explaining and showing it. Once the neck gussets are done, I can attach the sleeves. Usually these shirts have sleeves that are super billowy and require them to be gathered at the top of the shoulder, but because I was working with limited fabric, I didn't have enough to make the sleeves that full. So there is no gathering at the sleeve head, which is fine. The pin tucks give an illusion of gathers and I don't mind having a slightly slimmer sleeve profile that will be more practical for everyday wear. I'm pinning the sleeve in place, matching the top fold of the sleeve to the shoulder point of the body, right sides to right sides. This will make it very easy to sew the sleeve and gusset into the side seam all at once, which I will do with a back stitch because this seam carries a lot of stress and movement on it. After the sleeve is set in, I can continue to sew up the body side seams, this time with a running back stitch before felling the arm's eye and side seam allowances. Next step, attaching the cuffs. I'm using my favorite technique, divide and conquer. Basically, I'm marking the sleeves and cuffs in halves, then quarters, then eighths. Then I will pin the corresponding marks together and pleat the remaining sleeve material down to match the cuffs. Then I'll backstitch that seam.
After both cuffs are gathered and sewn, I'll sew the sides of the cuffs together, right sides together, clip the corners, and flip it right side out. Then I can turn the remaining hem under and whip stitch it closed. I hadn't yet cut the front slit in the neckline because I didn't want it to fray. Since it falls in the middle of one of those sets of three pin tucks, I've seam ripped the middle one down to the bottom mark and tied it off so it won't unravel further. Then I cut down to the mark and finished it with a rolled hem. I forgot to get footage of it, but I finished the bottom of the slit with a buttonhole stitch. I also did a bar tack just above the buttonhole stitch, which is just a couple of lengths of thread sewn back and forth and then a buttonhole or ladder stitch done over those. It keeps the bottom of the slit from ripping if there's stress put on it. With the front slit finished, I can then gather the neckline to the collar using the same process as the cuffs. I've marked out where the buttonholes should go on the cuffs, and after using my buttonhole punch to cut them, I will sew them using some silk buttonhole twist thread I've had in my stash for years. One of my favorite details on this shirt is that all of the buttons are completely mismatched.
Thank you to all of my current and continuing Kofi members, especially my newest member, Finn. Your support and the support of all of my members and croissants makes it easier to do what I do and to provide quality content for everyone. Thank you so much. Stick around after this brief commercial break to see me make the waste center. I started off by printing my pattern and finding my proper size. Since I'm very pear-shaped, I often have to customize patterns. In this case, my waist and high hip are one size and my rib cage is two sizes smaller, which is about normal for me. So I'll mark off the transition between sizes and then cut each pattern piece out. The pattern instructions call for fusing fashion fabric and interlining fabric together first and then cutting the pieces out, but since I am dealing with literal scrap pieces, I'm going to go about it a different way. I'm fussy cutting the silk pieces first, trying to keep as big of a chunk as I can left over to make bias tape from. There's no seam allowance built into the pattern, which I actually prefer as it makes pinning and sewing along the marked line so much easier. I'll use the silk pieces as a template to cut out the structural material. Technically it should be coutil, but I had cotton twill, so that's what I'm using, and the fusible web. Once everything is cut out, I'll fuse the silk and twill together between layers of parchment paper to make sure that any fusible web doesn't stick to my ironing board cover or my iron. Again, this is not the easiest or quickest way to do this, but it works. At this point, I realized that I should have marked the twill instead of the silk because I won't be able to see the sewing lines. So I'm using pins to mark the corners of each pattern piece and replacing it on the twill side with friction marker. Don't do what I did, kids. Learn from my mistakes. Now I can start pinning the pieces together and sew them on my new vintage Singer featherweight sewing machine. I wanted a project that had just straight lines to practice on and this waist cincher was perfect. The machine I'm sewing on was commissioned in December 1948 and is an absolute joy to sew on. I can't wait to get to know her a little better.
After all the seams are sewn, I ironed them flat and trimmed down the allowances to make sure they will all be covered by the boning channel tape. I'm using twill tape as a waist stay to make sure that nothing stretches as I wear it, basting it to the seam allowances to make sure it sits correctly while sewing the boning channels in. This pattern doesn't come with a lining like my 1780 stays did, so the boning channels are formed by sewing lengths of twill tape over the seam allowances, which will both enclose the raw edges and create pockets for the bones. For boning, I'm using heavy duty zip ties. They're not quite as stiff as synthetic whalebone, but they work just fine, to be honest, especially for garments like this where there is minimal body shaping. They're also easier to cut and shape with scissors, and they don't take as much filing to get rid of sharp edges. The edges of this corset are finished with bias tape. Normally I prefer to use the continuous tape method where you do some cutting and sewing and marking magic and end up cutting one big continuous line of tape as the last step. I didn't have enough fabric to do that here though so I just cut a bunch of little strips and sewed them together one at a time. Fussy and tedious yet effective is kind of the theme of this garment.
After that's all assembled, I'm ironing the seam allowances open and cutting all the little sticky out bits before running it through one of my bias tape maker thingies and ironing it in half. Then I can trim off the extra seam allowances that I left on the corset completely on purpose and not at all by accident before sewing on the bias tape to the outside of the waist cincher. I prefer a cleaner look to my corsets with no top stitching and I can never get the hang of stitch in the ditch so I am whip stitching the other side of the bias tape to the inside while finishing up my audiobook. Hit me up Audible, I want a sponsorship. In addition to doing everything the harder way, using new machines is also a theme for this corset. I'm so jazzed to finally test out my new grommet setting thingy and I'm pleased to report that it works like a charm.
This is the tall ship Alyssa. She's docked in Galveston, where she serves as a museum dedicated to the history of the port island and sailing ships in general. She is so beautiful. I really want to climb the ropes, but they get super mad at you when you try. The library is lacking. Thanks for joining me today, everyone. I wanted to take a quick moment to thank everybody for your well wishes, sympathy, and support on the subject of Bran's passing. It means the world to me to know that he was well loved beyond this household. I also wanted to do a couple of quick announcements. First of all, I will be presenting again at the Tournament of Defense this November. I'll be teaching the Queer History Lecture and the Gores and Gussets class again, and also adding an Introduction to Smocking class. More details to come on my socials this week. And secondly, I finally have a Discord announcement. I finally got the spoons together to get the Discord server all sorted and running. I've already done a soft launch for Kopi members just to make sure that all of their wrinkles were ironed out. Thanks y'all for being my guinea pigs. I totally appreciate that. The server isn't just for members, although there are some member specific boards. I didn't want it to just be exclusive for people who monetarily support the channel. I will be officially hard launching the public discord on July 1st, so keep an eye on my socials and the community tab here for the link. And once that's launched, we can also start talking about the book club again. I think Discord is going to be the easiest place to host that, so stay tuned for those exciting upcoming things. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe and click the bell if you like taking your chances, but I can't guarantee that YouTube will send notifications. It's been pretty hit or miss lately. If you're interested in finding me on social media, I am at Opus L and I everywhere, and those links will also be in the description box. I will also post the link to my Kofi where you can leave a one-time tip, browse my web shop, or join my membership tiers for additional content and a personal thank you of your very own in my next video. Until next time, be kind, do the work, continue supporting marginalized people, and keep creating. Well.